Okay, here we go. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's a little strange not to see you. Uh, I'm Michal Dekel. I am a professor of English and I'm the director of the Rifkin Center for the Humanities and the Arts um, at CCNY. I want to thank you for joining us for what is the first of a series of talks and conversations, hopefully, on the Middle East. I want to start by acknowledging what a difficult and painful moment this is, uh, first and foremost for in Israel and Palestine, um, but also, and for other reasons, globally in the U.S., and especially, I think, for us on U.S. campuses. I've been a professor at CCNY for 18 years. Before that, I was a graduate student. I got my PhD at Columbia. And I do not remember any event that took place outside of this country that has ignited stronger feelings and emotions uh, on my own campus in, in, in New York and elsewhere. Some of those feelings I have come to the conclusion uh, stem from the fact that it is exposed exactly how ill-prepared we are as a community and as, and, and as a, at universities to face such events. It exposed a breakdown in communication, knowledge, empathy, and the idea of a shared public sphere. Many of us are not sure others who we previously trusted have their backs, share their values, will keep them safe. And the same suspicion extends to institutions, including colleges and universities. And so the modest purpose of the series is first and foremost uh, for me to restore a bit of, of that, a bit of, of trust. I know that for many people, including some of my friends, now is a time for doing, not talking. People are organizing, people are um, protesting, people are fighting uh, wars. And uh, to the degree that they're talking, they are talking in echo chambers. Um, they're talking, um, activists are talking, not experts. Um, we have social media with its divisive algorithms also pulling us into increasingly hermetic echo chambers that are deliberately designed to stroke rage and divisiveness. So in the series, we thought of basically taking a step backwards to a more traditional role for academia, asking experts and those with direct knowledge and expertise from the region to share what they know with us. And I should say uh, in parenthesis, as someone who has been working on trying to put this this um, series together for a few weeks that uh, it's it's a very hard task. Uh, I think a lot of people are afraid to talk. Um, people who talk get burned and, and don't want to talk anymore. Um, and we need to fight that and reassume our role in, in academia as much as we can. Um, of course, any cho choice of speakers and events um, that we make here at the Rifkin Center is taking a position as well. So all I can say, um, knowing that I, some people will definitely be unhappy, um, is that we will try to be fair, as fair as as inclusive and as responsible as possible in these choices. And I believe our first speaker represents that fairness in representation. Our guiding parameters for the series, I repeat, and I wrote about this a couple of times, are expertise, lived experience of the region, including journalists, politicians, etc., and most importantly, compassion for all. Now, uh, this is a webinar. Um, in part, we had to do that because our speaker is not in New York. Um, we will take questions at the end of Professor Cohen's talk. Um, please type those questions in the Q&A. Uh, I will read them. Uh, we welcome any challenging questions, uh, but not declarations or provocations um, for their own sake. We're all hurting, but we are ultimately not the real victims of the moment um, from the luxury of our relative peace and safety 
here in New York, we are probably the only ones who can actually begin some kind of dialogue. Uh, our speaker today, whom I'm so delighted has agreed to, um, to be with us, is Professor Hillel Cohen. Professor Cohen is a historian of the Middle East, former chair of the Middle East Department at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, and the author of many books, among them Year Zero of the Arab-Israeli Conflict, 1929. He has also published extensively as a journalist, and his work has been featured in both Hebrew and Arabic venues, including Al Jazeera. His methodology is often described as a history from below. So, Professor Cohen, Hillel, I hand the virtual microphone to you. Thank you, Michal, very much for this invitation. Uh, the topic of my lecture is, uh, if we can call it a lecture, is the, the roots of the conflict. Because I think if we want to try to understand what is going on now, both in Israel in Gaza and also around the world regarding the war in Gaza, we have to see the different ways in which uh, the roots of the conflict are described by different actors or different groups or basically among Israelis and Palestinians. Now, I think uh, that I should say a few words about myself, not because I like to talk about myself, not much more that, than any other person, but because as uh, Michal said, it's, uh, I, you can uh, not only from my title, but also from my name to understand that I'm a, an Israeli Jew, also from my accent. And indeed I was born in Jerusalem. I'm Israeli Jew. My parents immigrated to Israel. My mother immigrated to Israel from Poland. My father immigrated to Israel from Afghanistan. He immigrated after the establishment of the State of Israel, and she luckily immigrated to Israel before the Holocaust in 1930. My family was a religious national Jewish family, observant family. And that means that when I, I, I was born in 61, and when I was uh, 12, more or less, it was a Yom Kippur War, the 1973 war, and immediately after the 73 war, the settlement movement, the settler movement of Gush Emunim was established. Gush Emunim was the movement that after the war 73, that was very devastating for Israel, their idea was to settle in the West Bank, in Judea and Samaria, is the right thing to do at that time in order to revive the spirit of the Jews in Israel. So I, I, I actually left school when I was 15 years old and I joined partly the settler movement. So I was among the first uh, settlers as, as a kid, as you understand, in, uh, in the Betel, in Betel settlement in the West Bank. But a bit earlier, I already started to study Arabic. I was attracted for various reasons to, to, to the Arabic language and, and to Arabic culture. I'm a Jerusalemite, so I used to visit the old city of Jerusalem and then the villages around Jerusalem. So when I entered uh, and settled in this in this settlement of Betel, immediately I, I noticed that around me there are only Palestinian villages and Palestinian refugee camps. And the nearest refugee camp was the res refugee camp of Jelazun. I was very naive. I... I left school, I knew nothing or very little about history of Israel-Palestine. And I was bored from studying too much. So what I did is to go for hours and days to the neighboring villages and refugee camps. And at that time, at that period of time, and I speak about the second half of the 1970s, Palestinians still had the old customs, meaning that every guest that entered a village or a refugee camp would be invited to drink a cup of tea if it's night to sleep over and so on and so forth. This was, this period was my first time which I met Palestinians in a way that I, I cannot say that I lived with them, but I spent hours and hours and hours with these people. 
the people in the refugee camp of Jalazun, and then I visited other refugee camps. And if I speak about the year 78, it is 30 years after the establishment of the State of Israel or the Nakba of the Palestinians. So people who were 50 years old, they were 20 during the Nakba. So they had fresh memories, I would say, about the Nakba. And when we sat together, I was interested in, in stories uh, of, of old people. So I used to sit with them and listen to stories about the period before 48, about the war of 48, about how they viewed the, the, the Zionists when they came to Palestine during the Mandate period and so on and so forth. This is what today we would call oral history, but I was not historian. I didn't know the term oral history, but I was very much interested. And of course, what I revealed during this uh, conversation was that Palestinians see history and the geography in a totally, completely different way than we do. We mean Israeli Jews. And this was a kind of revelation. So I was thinking, is it true all what they tell me? How can I understand it? And what they tell is true, what does it mean, to, uh, mean about what I was told as a young kid in Jerusalem? But I felt very strongly that they do not lie to me, that they tell me the truth. So I realized at that time that something that, of course, is, is, is very basic, is very simple, it, 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 I mean, it may be banal, that different people view history in different ways. They have different approaches different experiences, history. So I understood, of course, I didn't know the word narrative at that time. I didn't know that there is something like a Zionist narrative or a Palestinian narrative, but I heard a lot, a lot, many, many stories from many people. So what I'm going to do in the next uh, couple of minutes or half an hour is to tell the contradicting narrative on the roots of the conflict and, and, and to try to understand how come that there are so different ways to understand the, 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 the conflict from its very beginning. I have also to say, when I speak about the Zionist Jewish narrative, I speak as an insider. I speak as an insider because this is the narrative that I well, grew up with and this is who I am. I'm part of this narrative, though at the same time, I, I, in, a sense, in a sense, I internalized also part of the Palestinian narrative, but I'm not a Palestinian. I'm an Israeli Jew. I served in the army, including in the occupied territories. My son is now serving in the army. So when I speak about Palestinian narrative, I'm speaking as, as an outsider, and this should be clear to everyone. Now, Today, I have also more than 40 years of listening to people. And this, is my, this was, has been my main tool as a human being, as a scholar, listening with empathy to Palestinians and to Israelis. And also I have 20 years of archival, archival research. So I, you know, I, I, I did my PhD at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. I, I, I visited Israeli, Israeli archives. I, I, I visited also Palestinian archives. So I have both knowledge from what we can call the field and knowledge, historical knowledge from archives. So I hope that the way I will deliver both narrative would contribute anything to, to us participants. So I will start with the Zionist narrative, or better, the way in, by which Zionists experience their history, they tell their history, and they experience their current situation, and the way they view the conflict with the Palestinians. Then I will, will talk about the Palestinian side. How, 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 how do Israeli Jews see the history of Zionism at the root of the conflict? There are a couple of core beliefs that Zionists believe in 
And I would say that usually most Palestinians do not believe in. So the first of them is that there is such thing, the Jewish people. Zionists believe, and I would say for good reasons, that there is something which is the Jewish people. Why it is important to say, because there was a debate among Jews and also in other nations during the 19th century and also earlier, whether there is such a thing, a Jewish people. The Zionist movement came and said, yeah, the Jews everywhere, the Jews in, 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 in Eastern Europe, the Jews in North Africa, the Jews in Iraq, the Jews in England, all of them constitute one nation. This is the Jewish people, the Jewish nation. This actually was the raison d'etre of the Zionist movement. The second point is, that these people has strong religious and historical ties to the land of Israel. Now, anyone who reads the Bible would say, yeah, probably the Jews have strong historical and religious tie to the land of Israel. But we should know that some people deny it, or they might deny that the Jews of today are descendants of the sons of Israel of the Bible. But for Jews, for Zionists, this is the second part of belief, the second core belief that they have. The third one for the Zionist was, or is, that these ties, historical and religious ties, create rights. And I mean the right to return to Zion, the land of Israel, Palestine, and the right also to sovereignty over the land of Israel. The right of sovereignty is based also on additional element, the acute need of Jews to save heaven, especially the Jews of Europe, because of European anti-Semitism, persecution of Jews, even before the Holocaust and before the First World War. Another point is that the Jews' right should and was actually acknowledged by the international community. It means that the Jews or the Zionist movement did not act against the international legitimacy, but with a, a, a international legitimacy. So we can see it in the Balfour Declaration of 1917 officially, uh, but, and then it was also approved by the League of Nations in 1922 and by the United Nations in 1947, that the Jews uh, and the, the Zionist movement have the right sovereignty over the land of Israel or parts of the land of Israel. Another very important point in Zionist narrative is that the Zionists aspired to live in peace with the Palestinians, with the Arabs of Palestine. They believed that the establishment of a Jewish state in Palestine would bring prosperity, not only to the Jews, but also to all the inhabitants of Palestine and maybe the Middle East as a whole. Now, so why there is a conflict? So according to the mainstream Zionist narrative, the conflict is a result of incitement of corrupt and anti-Semite Arab leaders. Many Palestinian Arabs would, ac would have accepted Zionism if not for the Palestinian Arab leader that rejected Jewish immigration to Palestine for personal, re for personal reason. And then they launched attacks on Jewish settlements, actually already in late 19th century, and of course, during the mandate days, mandate days between 19 or British British rule on Palestine between 1917 and 1948, the attacks reached their peak 1948 in the war of 1948. This war, again, we are talking, narrating the the, the, the Zionist narrative. This war started because the Arabs rejected the United Nations Partition Plan of 1947. And this partition plan was based on the idea of establishing one Jewish state and one Palestinian state on Palestine or, or Eretz Israel, what we call today the state solution. The Palestinians rejected this idea. They started a war against Israel and they lost the battle. Half of, half of the Palestinians became refugees. And since then, actually, they refused to compromise to accept the Jewish state. This is the, these are the, the roots of the conflict. 
the Jews came peacefully. They wanted to live in peace with the, the, the Palestinians. They came to their homeland. And the Palestinians didn't want them here. So they were not aggressors. They came in order to create a peaceful relation with the Arab, but the Arabs rejected. This narrative, I would say, is very powerful. For some, it also, they can see it as very con convincing narrative. Mainly, the argument that the Arabs are the aggressors and the Jews are the victims of this aggression. Now, let's see how Palestinians view this very history. In a sense, Palestinian narrative is much more simple. They do not need complicated arguments. They do not need complicated arguments because their basic claim is very simple. This, the claim is, we, the Arabs of Palestine, live in Palestine, who have lived in Palestine for centuries, thus, this is our country. And this is our country. We have the right to establish a nation state in our country when we enter the age of nationalism, meaning after the first world war. Point number two, the Palestinian Arabs are part of the bigger Arab nation, but following the European occupation of the Middle East in the world war, the first one, the area was divided into states. Thus, the local identity as Palestinians was strengthened. And the right, their right to establish a nation state was created. Another point is that Palestinian nationalism in its earlier stages was inclusive nationalism. And it separated religion, religion from state. What does it mean? It means that in Arab nationalism in general, it is true for the pan-Arab movement, it is true for Syria, for Iraq, for Egypt and other states. Muslims, Christians and Jews, they are part of the nation. And this is very different, of course, of course, from the Zionist national movement, which is based on religion, religious identity. So it is true also for the Palestinian national movement, that it is very stark invited the Jews of Palestine to be part of the national movement. They said we have problem with the Zionist immigrants because the Zionist immigrants, they do not want to join us to our homeland. They want to make our homeland into a Jewish state. Now, local Muslims also say or remind us, they always accepted other communities, Jews included. This, it was very common for me to hear from Palestinians in the refugee camps and in other places that for centuries Jews lived in peace under Muslim rule. And not only that they lived in peace, in peace under Muslim rules, also throughout the years when Jews were persecuted in other places, they found refuge in Muslim countries, including in Palestine. Of course, the, the very famous example for that is the expulsion of Jews from Spain in 1492. And when Jews were expelled from Spain, they were absorbed in the Ottoman Empire, including in Palestine, and the flourishing, famous Jewish commute, community of Safad in the Galilee, in North Palestine, in North Eretz Israel, was established under Muslim rule in the, in, 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 in the Ottoman period meaning that there is no enmity between Muslims and Jews. Not, and not only that there is no enmity, they welcome them this part in other places. And also, people who know the local history of Jerusalem, for example, knows that the first Jewish neighborhoods that were established in, in Jerusalem were established on lands that was bought from Palestinians. And it was bought from Palestinians in the Shari courts, in the Muslim courts, because at that time, prior to Zionism, it was legal to sell land to Jews. Today, of course, or from the beginning of Zionism, became against the Sharia, against the Muslim law. So what is the problem? The problem, or the root of the conflict, is the desire of Zionism to make Palestine into a Jewish state. So it's not only a problem because 
you know, this is our country and you want to take our country from me. But also they felt it. And this was very strong in the older generation. Today, I do not meet people who talk like that. But the older generation, they used to say, the Jews betrayed us. The Jews betrayed us. We helped them when they were under very difficult conditions. But when they had a bit more power and when Europe became more powerful, they aligned with Europe, with Christian Europe, with the new crusaders in order to expel us Muslims from our country. So of course, according to this narrative, it is very clear who are the aggressors here. The Zanis who acted together with colonial Britain in order to make Palestine Jewish. So Arabs attacks on early Jewish colonies and actually all attacks of Arabs on Jews are justified by Palestinians as legitimate acts of self-defense. This is an important point, of course, for Jews, Israeli Jews or Zionists or whatever we call them. For them, it is clear that the Arabs are the aggressors and all what they do is self-defense. The war on Gaza now is self-defense. The 1948 war is, was self-defense. The war of 67, self-defense. The Israel invasion to Lebanon is self-defense. Why it is clear to them is because they are attacked by, by Arabs, by Palestinians. For Palestinians, of course, the story is totally different. No, we are attacked. We are attacked not only by tanks and by artillery, and by aircraft, we are attacked by settlements, by the fact that Jews come to Palestine and they build more and more kibbutzim and moshavim and colonies and so on and so forth. So this is why for them, Zionism is colonialism and they have the right to fight against colonialism. So if we just say a few words about the war of 1948, we mentioned that according to the Zionist narrative, the war started because of the rejection of the, of the partition plan by the Palestinians. But for the Palestinians, the, 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 the partition plan of the UN was part of the plot against them that was orchestrated by the Zionist organization and the West in order to make in Palestine a Western pro-Western society and state and to fight against the Arab world. And they say, this is our homeland. We had guests here, the Jews. How come that they, these guests can claim now 50% or actually 55% of the territory? So the, the war or first of all, the rejection of the partition plan for them was like natural. Why should we give half of our homeland? And the expulsion or the uprooting of Palestinians from their villages, about half of the population of Palestine was uprooted in the Nakba out of 1.2 million, about 700,000 Palestinians were uprooted. For them, it was not a result of the war that they opened, as the Zionists said. For them, it was a fulfillment of an old Zionist plan. Because they say, if the Zionists from the very beginning wanted to establish a Jewish state in Palestine, how come that they could establish such a state if there is a majority of Palestinians on the land. So it is clear to them that the Zionism from the very beginning planned to evacuate the, 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 the Arabs of Palestine. So this narrative, again, one might, might say, is also co coherent and by itself also convincing. So 
What we are, have here are two contradicting narrative. Both of them make sense, at least to me. Both of them authentic. Both of them represent collective experiences of Zionists and Palestinians, respectively. So this is the way I see the roots of the conflict. Now, I want to mention there is another component of the of narrative, and this is how we can say it this way. Actually, each narrative ha has both sides: what each people tell about himself and what they tell about the other. So, what Zionists tell about themselves, what they tell about the Palestinians, what Palestinians tell about themselves, and what they tell about the Jews or the Israelis. And, uh, and uh, here, you can, uh, you can see the following. The Zionists say, we are nation, the Palestinians are not nation. The Palestinians say the same. The Zionists say, we are natives of this land. The Palestinians are not native of this land. And the Palestinians say, we are the natives of the land. You are not the natives. Now, how come? It is because the Jews say we are natives of this land because of their old ancient history. So we lived here for generations. It, it is true that we were in exile, but it was an exile. But this is our homeland. And what they say about the Palestinians, the Palestinians actually, there are some tribes who came from different areas of the Middle East, some families who came from Iraq, from Egypt, immigration, a, a people who seek jobs in the Zionist market and so on and so forth. They are not, they are not from here. And also they say, I should, explain why each side say that the other is not nation. The, the Jews say, or the Zionists say, the Palestinians are not nation. You, you, you cannot find the term Palestinian people before the 20th century. There was no such a thing as Palestinian people. And actually they, 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 they don't have the same ancestors. They came from different places and they are part of the large Arab nation. They are not nation by themselves. The Palestinians say, and this is also, if you can read the PLO Charter of 1964 and 1968, that Judaism is religion. It's not a nation. They do not constitute a nation. Why? Because for them, to be a nation, you have to belong to a certain place, to have a shared culture, a shared language, and so on. So. The Arabs of Palestine, they have shared, shared territory and shared culture, shared language. They are people. But the Jews who are everywhere in the world, you know, the Jews of Brooklyn, they do not speak the same language as the Jews of Morocco. And they do not have the same culture. And they, and, and they have nothing in common except for religion. So they are. Judaism is religion and not, and not, a, and, and not a, a nation. And what is nation? according to, to Zionism, it's being of the same ancestor. We are all part of the tribe of Judea. And even the, the name Jews and the name of the land, Judea, tells, tell us that this is our homeland and we are the same nation. So we can see here totally different approaches to history to what is a nation, to what is a native. And actually the, 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 the discussion or the debate or the conflict is not about facts. So when we look and, and, and debate about facts, okay, this is fine and it may, sometimes it makes sense, but the debate or more profound debate is how to frame the facts. And now about the framing of the conflict in general, I, I, I will add the following. There are three main ways to frame the Israeli-Palestinian conflict currently. One framework is that this conflict is national co conflict. What does it mean? That there are two national movements or two nations or two groups that 
that claim that they are nation, that they compete on the same territory. So this is national national conflict. There is another ex explanation. This is a religious conflict. So these people say that what we see now is continuation or part of generation of religious enmity, religious enmity between Islam and Judaism. And this is why the holy places, especially Al-Aqsa or Temple Mount, is in the heart of the conflict. You know that since 1929, the, 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 the revolt of 1929, the Palestinian revolt of 1929 started because of the idea or the thought that the Jews want to take over the Al-Aqsa Mosque. And it was also true in 1991 in the first Intifada, and it was also the same in the in second Intifada that was called Al-Aqsa Intifada in the name of the Holy Mosque on the Holy Mountain. And, and, it, was, and it is true also for the current event, which was called by Hamas to fan Al-Aqsa. So, this is another way to frame the conflict is a religious debate, a religious conflict. And actually religious conflict is which religion is a true religion? Who is beloved son of Abraham? Was it Yitzhak, the father of the Jews or Ishmael, the father of the Arabs? And to whom God promised the land that we are debating here, the Holy Land. So this is a second framework, uh, 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 frame the current conflict. And the third one is that this is a conflict between a colonial power or a colonial state and the colonized. So according to this uh, framework, the Palestinian struggle is anti-colonial struggle and it is it should be seen like other colonial, anti-colonial movements were seen as a legitimate uprising against colonialism. Now, of course, in the eyes of Zionists, nobody would accept, nobody from the, the Zionist mainstream that Zionism is colonialism. And, and, and they have two strong arguments why Zionism is not colonialism. First of them is that the Jews are not part of a colon, colonial nation. It's not like Britain that some people, British people came to, the, to, to America and established colonies. It's totally different. The Jews do not have empires that they belong to. So this is one argument. The second argument is that this holy land Eretz Israel, the land of Israel, is a Jew, the Jews' homeland. You cannot be a colonizer in your homeland. So these are two important arguments why Zionism is not colony, colonial movement. On the other hand, one cannot ignore, and this is the argument why Zionism is part of the colonial phenomena, that what enabled Zionism was the colonial powers. Without the Balfour Declaration, without the British occupation of Palestine, the Jews would have remained a tiny minority of Palestine. When the, when, when, when the British forces occupied Palestine in 1917, the Jews were more or less 10% of the population. About 70 or 60, Thousand people out of 700,000 people who lived in the Holy Land. So they were a tiny minority. What enabled them to become a minority, but much more significant minority in 1947, they constituted in 1947 33%, third of the, one third of the population was the British rule. And, the, and Britain was also the superpower who enabled them to, to, to establish more and more settlements, to have paramilitary power and so on and so forth. So for sure they are, according to this view, 
part of uh, colonial power. And also the another argument is that Zionism has used from its very beginning and actually until now practices of settler colonialism because what Zionism, the Zionist movement did in late Ottoman period during the mandate, after the establishment of the state of Israel, after the occupation of the West Bank and Gaza Strip in 1967, to build more and more settlements, to evacuate Palestinians from their land, sometimes great numbers, sometimes in small numbers. So this is settler colonialism, this is clear, according to this view. Now, when we say that there are three ways to analyze uh, the, 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 the conflict, it does not mean that they exclude each other. Actually, we can see in, 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 in our conflict, we can see the national uh, uh, paradigm, uh, uh, we can see the religious one, and we can see the colonial, the colonial struggle. So now, last words. When we encounter such contradictory narrative, what can we do? First of all, we ask ourselves, can these narratives be bridged? I mean, can the Zionist narrative and the Palestinian one find any meeting point that people would say, okay, we can agree to this and this? And, 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 and I can say about my students when I teach the Israeli narrative and the Palestinian one, so some of them actually come to the conclusion that this, uh, this conflict cannot be solved. It cannot be solved. Because the, 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 gap, the gap is too wide. I think that it's not necessarily so. I cannot convince in my view. I can say about myself, I can say that I can live peacefully with these two narratives. But, but maybe I say so because I'm, I'm Israeli Jew and I have state and I have a strong army and I have a, I, I, I was not a refugee. Currently there are a couple of hundreds of thousand Israelis that are refugee inside the state of Israel because of the war in Gaza and the war in the northern border. But relatively, maybe I can be more inclusive because I have already a state that I belong to and so on and so forth. But I think it's not, it's not the, the, the only reason. I think that uh, it's not impossible to accept the very basic fact that Different people view history in different ways. We experienced it differently. The experiences of Jews and of Palestinians of the War of 48 is very different. The Jews established a state and became from a stateless nation to people with a state, and Palestinians became stateless and were uprooted. So it is totally different experience. Of course, they tell it differently, but we are speaking on the same events. And before the fake news became so common, we also agreed upon most of the facts. So I think the first stage is to acknowledge that others have also a legitimate story to tell. Now, the legitimate story that they tell, it is mainly what they, tell about themselves. What they tell about others is usually less convincing. But what Jews tell about themselves, about their experience, there's no reason to ignore it. You do not have to accept politically what they have done, but to understand that there was anti-Semitism, to accept that they, they need a refuge, to accept that they wanted a state, and then to debate whether they behaved correctly or not, or morally or not. This, but to view them and to understand them, the, the motivations of Jews to come to Palestine. And 
it is true also to understand the Palestinian narrative. I mean, and not to lie about it, not to lie about the Zionist narrative and not to lie about Palestinian narrative. What do I mean by lying? To lie about Zionist narrative is to say the Jews came to Palestine in order to kill the Arabs and, and expel them. This is not true. We can, we should be more nuanced about that, but it is not true if it is told this way. The same is lie when we speak about the way some Zionists speak about the Palestinians, meaning when they say, you know, Islam is about killing Jews. No, you cannot talk like that. Because if Islam was about killing Jews, they could have killed all the Jews under the rule of Islam before Zionism. So why before the age of Zionism, Jews were welcomed in the land of Israel and in other Arab and Muslim countries? So for sure we cannot argue that this is Islam. And we have to understand that the roots of the conflict is the age of nationalism. Of course, there, there was hostility or enmity sometimes between Judaism and Islam as religions, but there were, were also good relations and good terms and so on. We cannot tell and, 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 and portray and present history with such simplicity. So we can see that in the age of nationalism and when Zionism came with good or less good arguments and claimed its right to establish a Jewish homeland in Palestine, okay. The Palestinians rejected it. The Zionists had good reason to try to do it. And this, these are the roots of the conflict. Now we have to evaluate and reevaluate what happened since and what we want to do with these very facts and these very frameworks of understanding and this narrative that we really rooted in this in these narratives what we can do with them in order to make a better future if we assume that we want a better future and last last word words both in israel and palestine there is no one view about how to deal with the conflict both among palestinians and israelis there are groups or streams who believe that they can defeat the other side. So you have the, the Palestinians who believe that now Gaza, Hamas of Gaza attacked Israel, if Hezbollah joins them, and if the Arab citizens of Israel join them, and the, if the Palestinians of the West Bank join them, and in, if, if, if volunteers from the Arab state join it, and the Houthis from Yemen join, so maybe, or this is the hope, we can destroy the state of Israel. Among Israelis, you have these who believe we can fight against Gaza and against the West Bank and we can expel the rest of the Palestinians as we did in 1948 to bring them another Nakba and to establish a Jewish settlement everywhere from the river to the sea. So we have this good. On the other hand, you have both Palestinians and Israelis that understand or believe that both Jews and Arabs are here in Palestine, Eretz Israel, to stay. And if they are here to stay, okay, we have religion and we have nationalism and we have dreams and we have beliefs and, and so on and so forth. But we have also small kids that we want that they continue living. And we have daily life and we want to live in dignity and, and we don't want to defeat the other. We are ready to live in peace with the other given that we can live in security, in dignity, and this is in, enough. And of course, liberty. So the question is, who would be stronger in the near future and also in the less near future? But we have to remember that these narratives are the way we talk about the past during conflict. And we can use these narratives also in order to bring a better future for everybody between the river and the sea. So this is how I see the, the, the narratives and the role. 
and now maybe we can open for discussion. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Ilail. Uh, this was um, I, I, this was a, such a um, helpful and brilliant and even-handed account, I believe. And uh, many of our um, many of our um, spectators at home have, have written that in the comments. Um, maybe people should you know get a drink of water and and rest for a moment, and then um, and 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 we can continue. The I guess the um, Many people have written comments. I wanna, um, I wanna, um, right. So somebody wrote, first of all, just to compliment you, this was the best, most thorough, balanced historical overview of, I have ever heard. Bravo. Uh, my question, uh, this person writes, which I realize is an unfair one. What happens now? We have two competing and incompatible narratives. What do we do with this? Where do we go? How do we go forward except with war and the assertion of raw military power? And if not that, how do we teach acknowledgement, listening and understanding? And how do we center nuance in textbooks, elementary schools, political discourse, etc., on both sides? Well, you, <laughs> that's a hard one. Look, I think, there are people who, who, who try to do that, you know? We try to be more balanced, some of us, to be more balanced in our textbook, to try to be more balanced in our in the way we present history. But it is true that, uh, especially in, in, in days like, like that, and when I say day, days like that, I mean days of, of war and bloodshed, it's very difficult to people to hear the other side or to try to understand the, the, the other side. Today in Israel, when you say, you know, my heart is with the kids of Gaza. So even people who are not, uh, you know, cruel or whatever, they say, many times I hear it, we don't have place in our heart for other people. We, 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 we are, it's too difficult for us now to think of other. We have enough of misery for, for ourselves. But at the same time, we, we, we cannot be silent because, you know, people are being killed all the time and, and, and we have to try to do what we can do. It, it's minority now in both societies. And I think for, for, for many years, uh, there is no majority in both societies that believe in living in peace. It's, it's not what, what they aim at. Um, maybe uh, something, a question more an answerable. Um, for you, Hilel, um, let's see, um, he's, this person is writing, thank you for talking about the narratives of Jews and Arab lands, um, but you talked about the period following the 90, um, okay, sorry, I'm curious, I'm curious to hear about the fin de siècle narratives in this regard, and that is often a point of contention given the advent of Zionism, Arab nationalism, and the impact of European colonialism. Yes. Uh, uh, I think there's no doubt that uh, the rise of Zionism it changed the attitude of Arab national movement to, 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 to the Jews of Arab's land, because what happened at that time is that at the very beginning of, of Arab nationalism in general, and I speak again on Iraq, Syria, Egypt, mainly, the, 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 of course, North Africa, the main, the main countries where there were large Jew, Jewish communities, the Jews were invited to be part of the Arab national movement. And we saw, we saw it in Syria that they were represented, we, in Iraq, they were represented in the, in the Arab national movement, of course, also in the Communist Party and so on. But what happens then is that you now I'll go back a, a, a minute and say, look, Jews everywhere, I'm an Israeli Jew, I was, was born here, I don't have problem of, of dual loyalty, but Jews everywhere in the 19th century, the end of the 19th century, during the 20th century, there was a problem of dual loyalty. If Judaism is nationalism, so if you are a, a Jew, you belong to two nations at the same time. So this is true in Argentina. It is true in the United States. 
to whom you are more loyal to to your to the United States or to the state of Israel. But of course, the, the main problem is for Jews in Arab states. Why? Because there are two national movements that, that they are competing. They are not allies like United States and Israel, and there are also problems in the United States. I mean, the case of Jonathan Pollard, of course, of course jumps into mind. But in, in, in the Arab world, if you are a, an Iraqi Jew, if you support Zionism, it means that you fight against Arab nationalism, because according to Arab nationalism, Palestine belongs to the Arabs. And according to the Zionist movement, Palestine belongs to the Jews. So what can you do? So you have to choose or to hide your sympathies and so on and so forth. And this brought about a lot of suspicion against the Jews. So this was one main reason, not only reason, why Zionism in a sense put the Jews of Arab lands in danger. But I say this is not the only reason, and I even cannot say that this is the most important reason. Because at the very same time, meaning the beginning of the 20th century, among Arab nationalists started also the stream of, of Islam as the most important component of Arab nationalism, what later became, you know, political Islam. So according to these people, actually Jews cannot be full partners of Arab nationalism. Like what happened in, 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 in France and in Germany, you know, if you are Jews, you cannot be part of, of, of the German people because you are Jews. And this is, if we take France, the Dreyfus affair and so on. But again, in the Arab world, it became much more difficult to Jews. And this led, of course, to immigration after the establishment of, of the state of Israel, mainly of immigration of these Jews to the state of Israel, sometimes by expulsion and sometimes because they felt inconvenient. But this is because the Zionist movement saw itself as the representative of these Jews and they cannot represent them if they stay there because they became enemy for the local population. Um, thank you. So uh, another question, what has been the impact of the on the dominance of a narrative of the near doubling of the Israeli population after the release of Jews from the USSR? Um, thanks to our own Senator Jackson, boosted by the fall of the USSR, Operation Moses, Aliyah, and the likes of US Argentina. Has it contributed to the sharp turn of Israel in a zero sum state, which has earned the moniker attached by the man of camp? Anyway, I mean, what I guess the, the, the question is what is, I guess, what has been um, the impact of the, of the immigration of Jews from the USSR um, on this narrative, I suppose? I, I, I'm not sure that the, the, it has impact on the narrative. It was the impact on the, on the state of Israel in the sense that it strengthened the state of Israel, because many many of these of these newcomers, as we call them, they 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 were highly educated, and also when we speak about population, it 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 was about one million people who, who immigrated to Israel, and it um, I think in a sense it strengthened also the the settlement in the in the in the West Bank, so these are the main contributions or or, or implications of, of Jewish immigration. Um, somebody wrote, I was surprised to hear Dr. Cohen say that one of his parents immigrated to Israel in the 1930s, and I'm interested in his, in this choice of words to refer to the land at the time. I Can guess, you say, ask again? I guess this person is saying, I, I, I think that you, when you spoke about one of your parents immigrating to to what you said, Israel in the 1930s, this was before the establishment of Israel. So he's wondering about your choice of words, or she. It's an anonymous, anonymous question. <laughs> okay, so, uh, so I, I, I will answer anon anonymously as well. What I mean is to the land of Israel. And because because in Hebrew th this land was called the land of Israel, and actually my grandfather, when he decided to come to Palestine, it was for him the land of Israel. Of course, it was not for him Palestine. 
because we have to remember that that the Jews, for them everywhere, they had, in a sense, they had they had in mind the map of the land of Israel because they read in the Torah in the in the, in the Hebrew Bible every week, so they know where Shechem, Nablus is, and when Bethel is, and when Jerusalem is, and when Hebron is. So this is part of their of their map. So they immigrated to the land of Israel. A few people are asking about your view on the two-state solution. Um, is it still possible after this wave of hate and distrust? I think it uh, it is now, in a sense, there is more chance to have two-state solution than before. And before, and uh, we believe that this is impossible for 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 a couple of years because because what we witnessed in the last. 15 years, it's it's a, a, a really growth of the settlement, the Jewish settlement in the West Bank. And we had the, we had the governments that rejected the idea of a territorial compromise in the West Bank. So in this sense, we, we I mean, most people in Israel and scholars abroad and so on, we buried the, the idea of two-state solution. And the and the and the, that meant actually that there is no solution. That is the point. That there is no solution because one state for all was not also part of the uh, a real part of the uh, 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 of the game. I mean, nobody really wanted it. Neither Palestinians nor Israel for for for, for different reasons. And uh, what Netanyahu government try to do was to bypass the Palestinians as the idea was that we, we 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 can there is no Palestinian nationalism anymore and we can have agreement with Saudi Arabia and with with, with the Gulf states and in, with Morocco and so on and so forth so the Palestinians are not uh, in the play anymore so if they are not in the play anymore also the two state solution is not part of the political discussion anymore but now when Palestinians, in a sense, we don't know because we are, when we are talking, the Israeli tanks are moving in Gaza Street and buildings are being destroyed and people are being killed. Now, mainly Palestinians before, and it was also Israelis. So we do not know how it would end and whether Hezbollah would join the battle or not and so on. So, so but from Palestinian perspective, at least, Palestinian nationalism is again on the table. And if it is again on the table, the question of, of the possibility or the demand to establish a Palestinian state in the territories is, is, is again part of the diplomatic discourse. Thank you. Um, Deborah Drucker writes, um... She's she's questioning the use of the, the why are we still using the term Zionist and anti-Zionist? Um, she writes, I think the word Zionist as a description of it of as a she says she thinks of the word Zionist as a description of a historical mo movement, but in Israel now exists as a sovereign nation. Do you think using the word Zionist post nineteen forty eight perpetuates the idea? That the validity of the state of Israel is still tenuous and can be dismantled. Ah, not at all, not at all. I actually, I, I, I use the term or Zionist or Israeli Jews because you know, twenty percent of the of the citizens of Israel are Arabs, and 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 they are not part of the of the Israeli narrative because it's not Israeli narrative, it's Jewish-Israeli narrative or Zionist narrative. This is the only, only reason why I use the Zionist narrative. And also because they, as historian, I read this narrative from early, you know, from late 19th century. And, and I, so it is actually the same narrative since then until today. So for me, it's a Zionist narrative. It has nothing to do with evaluation or, of its legitimacy or the legitimacy of the state of Israel, of course. Um, another question has to do with the Palestinian principle of the right of return. To what extent is this a symbolic um, 
desire or is it an aspiration that might undermine the right of Israeli Jews to self-determination? I guess from your sources. Yes, I think that there is no doubt that the, the, the refugee problem is one of the core problems of the conflict and and uh, and you know officially Palestinians do not give up the right of return. When it comes to to discussions, officially and unofficially, there are some things to say about it. But beforehand, we have to say, I have to say the following. If Israelis and Palestinians would want to reach a political settlement, they will definitely find a way to do it. I think there is, there is no political will and there is no popular will to end the conflict in both sides. And if there is a political will, the question of how to deal with the refugee problem, how many refugees would return to the land, how many would return to the West Bank, how many would be compensated and how much they would get. These this are technicalities, techna, how you say? This is the technical questions, okay? This is not the, the, the real question. The real question is whether you agree to the fact that there are two nations in here and you agree that they have the right to stay here and they have the right to self-determination. If both sides agree to this principle, okay, they can debate about the, the, the specifics of the solution, but they would be able to reach it, including about the refugee problem. Because in the, according to most polls among refugees, it depends on the options that they have. If they have options, of course, now we have problems also in having such options, but to immigrate to Europe, to immigrate to, to Canada, to Australia, to the Western world in general. So a huge percentage of Palestinian refugees from Lebanon, from Jordan, from Gaza Strip, they would have chosen to do that. Yeah. So, so again, it's a matter of political will and not of a, a question. Of course, Israel would be asked or demanded to take some responsibility for the creation of the refugee problem, something that they, we, uh, as a state, but they, as the government, refused to do. And it would be also part of the of the healing of, 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 of the conflict. But we, we, we are so far from there because we are now creating a new refugee problem. So we are in the problem, not, not in the solution, so to speak. Yeah. Well, more on the problem. Um, I mean, I didn't really want to do a talk on the precisely on the current moment, but we have a question about Hamas. Um, which I, I know it's not necessarily your area of expertise, but you do read in the resources. And um, maybe you can speak a little bit about Hamas. Um, the, I mean, the person, the person who wrote the question writes, um, many failed to realize that Hamas does not represent the feelings and aspirations of the vast number of Palestinians in the Middle East. And maybe you can comment on that. Um, unfortunately, countries like Iran are using Hamas to fight a proxy war. Um, so maybe you can maybe just say a few words on on, on what's happening now. Well, uh, well, I I think that Hamas uh, represented and represent uh, I don't know if majority, but but um, a significant portion of the Palestinian people. It doesn't mean that the uh, people uh, sub supporting uh, raping women in war zones and killing babies and so on and so forth. To support Hamas is to support attacking Israel for its refusal, I speak from Palestinian perspective, attacking Israel for its refusal to enable the establishment of a Palestinian state, attacking Israel for the humiliation it, it is causing for dozens of years to the Palestinians. So humiliating the Israelis by 
attacking by surprise the Israeli forces is legitimate, uh, and many things, other things that are legitimate. Now, when we, when we speak about, about, about Hamas, it, 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 Hamas in, in recent years went through a very a, 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 a process of, a, of change. Because very few people remember that when Hamas was established in early 1988, the Izzeddin, the, the, the brigades, Izzeddin al-Qassam, the brigades were established in 1990, late 1990 or 1991. The first years of Hamas activity, and I speak about armed activity, the rule within Hamas was not to kill civilians. And actually, actually, the, the main operations of Hamas in its first, the first years until 1994, it was kidnapping soldiers, killing soldiers, attacking military targets. This was an, until 1994. There was debate among Hamas about this, but this was the majority. Following the Oslo agreements between Israel and the PLO, and following the massacre of Muslim prayers in the Ibrahimi Mosque, in the cave of the patriarchs in Hebron, in February 1994, in which 29 Muslim prayers were killed by an Israeli doctor, Hamas changed its decision and started to attack also civilians by suicide attacks. So what we can see here is the, that the positions of Hamas are, are also changed over time according to political situation. Their aim at the mid 90s was both a kind of revenge to re uh, uh, following the, the massacre in Hebron, but also as they put it to create a kind of balance of horror between them and the IDF. Another aim was to destabilize Israel-Palestine and to stop the Oslo Agreement, which they feared would, would lead to establishment of a Palestinian authority under PLO in which they would not have a political power. So they had both internal and external uh, reason to move into suicide attacks and killing civilians. But what happened in the last 10 years among Hamas in Gaza, not necessarily the same in the West Bank, that they were isolated from other groups and a new doctrines were developed among, among Hamas members. And also, I think that the images or the examples of ISIS influenced Hamas militants very much because they saw how they can come with a couple of pickups and armed and storm uh, towns and villages and occupy them and kill and, and, and murder and, and whatever. And this was for them, you know, a kind of wow. You know, they were fascinated by this idea. So what we saw here in, in, in October 7 was both, you know, the result of, you know, global events like the, 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 the attempt to bypass the Palestinians by the agreement between the U.S., Saudi Arabia and Israel, and the development of tension within the, the, the Gaza Strip because of the, you know, poor condition, and the, the, the ISIS-like tendencies among, among part of the leadership of Hamas in Gaza. And this brought to this uh, brutal, cruel attack on, on the Western Negev of Israel and the, 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 Israeli, the Israeli settlement there. So uh, if I read correctly what Palestinians say and tell and write, many of them even if they do not support, as I said, Hamas in general and not everything that Hamas did, they have, at least they had at the beginning, some positive attitude towards the 
the blow that Hamas gave to Israel. Um, so we'll take maybe one, the last question, um, which might be a long answer. Um, I wonder if you could speak to past attempts, uh, peace attempts, so Oslo and other proposals that were on the table and why they failed? I think, uh, as I said, they failed because in both sides, they were strong uh, uh, groups, religious, but not only religious, that were against the idea of there are two nations here and th these two nations ha ha have the right to sovereignty. So in, in, in the Israeli side, uh, we can see the the expansion of, of the settlements, the, the assassination of Yitzhak Rabin, even the, the, the massacre in, in Hebron was in order to, to, to stop the peace process. And in the, the, the same was done by the Palestinians, by Hamas mainly. I mean, the suicide attacks and so on. Now, in a sense, both societies, there was a small majority that supported the agreements, but it was not a huge majority. This is one point. And the other is that in both societies, they had to decide whether they, I mean, the, the leaderships had to, to decide whether to start a kind of civil war against the opposition. I mean, the Israeli government, Rabin government against the right-wing opposition, uh, for example, to evacuate settlements after the massacre in Hebron, or not. And the same for the Palestinians, for Yasser Arafat, whether to enter a real war against Hamas or not. And the leadership in both nations or camps, it was easier for them, and it's easy to understand. It was easy for them to fight the, the enemy, the other nation, that to start a civil war among the nation. So this is what happened. I mean, a minority, and it was not a small minority, in both societies, they, they took the initiative and they had power, and they and, and 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 they 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 had enough power to destroy the peace process. Um. Yes, I mean there are various um versions of this question. I guess one uh, somebody writes, why, "Why do you think the Palestinians refuse to Clinton's two-state solution?" I guess Hillary Clinton recently talked about that. Um. But I guess you already answered that, unless you have something else to add, or I am interested in what uh, what uh, Clinton said about that. Um, I you think remember? I'm not sure. I think she recently said that Arafat was at the end; he was not interested uh, in, in this. Oh. Uh, but, uh -huh. Okay, there, there there is a huge debate about that about the the offer. What exactly was offered by 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 the state of Israel? whether the reason for the refusal of Arafat was a refugee pr problem or the problem of the holy places of, the, of Jerusalem. And, and, uh, and, and uh, I think the, during the years from the signing of Oslo Accords in September 1993 until the, the Camp David uh, uh, meetings, it was seven years, and during these seven years, the number of the settlers in the West Bank uh, doubled uh, from 100,000 to 200,000. Now there is half a million, but then it was from 100,000 to 200,000. And one of the um, strong arguments of, 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 of the Palestinian was how can that we negotiate about the future of these areas and you continue to swallow it? And they... This was not necessarily the reason why the negotiation failed, but it is part of the reason why Palestinians did not trust the Israeli government that Israel really wants peace. But you're saying ultimately, I mean, I, I mean it was interesting, which is that they, there was um, simply an, an attempt to avoid internal wars um, yeah, by sure. fighting the external enemy. And that seems to be 
often the case, right? So um, I guess this is another version of what we've been all been talking and what we're all thinking about these days. How about a pathway to peace and political solutions going forward? What's possible? Who needs to be involved? What are the conditions for such a future? Well, <laughs> I asked to talk about uh, I was asked to talk about the roots of the conflict, not mm -hmm. about the roots of the solution. But as I said, the roots of the solution are are in. I mean, usually we speak about the two two options, you know, uh, bottom up or from below. Bottom up, it means that the the international community would force Israel and Palestine to reach to reach a compromise. I don't know if it could happen and how it might happen and what w would be the 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 responses in Israel and Palestine to an attempt to forced a solution from outside. But also there's no I I don't think it's it's highly probable that it is going to happen. Uh, and from below it's it requires many, many years. I mean and it starts from education. But how can you educate to peace now? You know, there are hundreds of thousands of people who were injured or killed or their relatives were killed. And uh, so unless they, people would say, OK, we, we got the idea. Uh, fighting would, uh, fighting is bringing only suffering. So let's try another way. Yeah. But I, I, I don't see now, except for, I mean, people who still believe in this option, try to widen their audience and talk to more people and uh, but but in a sense it's not time to talk about peace but in another sense this is the time to talk about it so yeah well on this we have many many more questions and i'm i'm sorry we didn't get to them uh, but this seems like um like a good point to end this talk. Thank you all for joining us. And um, we will resume the series. Uh, the semester is practically over. We'll resume the series in the in the spring. Um, so end of January, beginning of February. Um, and please um, follow us on rifkincenter.org, um, on Facebook, on Instagram. You know, we even though we are fighting against social media distortion, we also use social media. Um, thank you again, Professor Cohen Hillel, for uh, for really a wonderful and enlightening presentation. And be safe. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.